Keith McCullough, welcome back. That was a short break. Now I'm gonna flip the switch to somebody running money, as opposed to Daniel Lakai and I running our mouths, which is uh, in our tweets and everything else. Uh, we do find that we have, at least we perceive to have value when we're providing that independent research. We do actually think that uh, there's a conflict of interest of a guy like Lakai or I we're actually running money. What we feel is the right way to do this is be a truly independent research provider that has no conflicts of interest that can help money managers like uh, DBR and Co's CEO Dave Root, who I'm about to get into a good conversation with, on how you know they can augment their processes, how they can invest money because it provides for a good partnership. And uh, I've known uh, Dave for a long time. We go all the way back to you know me actually making some pretty good trips to Pittsburgh while they're winning some 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 pretty nice Stanley Cups, right? Some Stanley Cups, yeah. yeah that's our, our claim to fame. Yeah. <laughs> Is that why we got along? <laughs> <laughs> hockey, I think hockey was part of the equation. Yeah, it was, sure, Keith. was part of the equation. Yeah. Uh, but congrats on all that you built. Uh, oh, thank you. And, and I want to I want to let people get. Uh, an understanding. A lot of our clients actually are uh, are net worth managers. Um, they haven't scaled like you have, so and and they certainly um, haven't gotten into this bigger is better game. So maybe right. like just kind of go back like, as far back as you want to go and where you are today and and how you've thought about building the platform. <laughs> well, I started 35 years ago. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you want to go back that far? <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see. Well, we've been DBR and Co uh, for 25 years. Yep. So. Um, we probably the best place to start is to talk about what we're not, if mm -hmm. I can. So, we we are not money managers, uh, stock pickers, portfolio managers in the traditional sense of the word. Um, we're more advice givers. <laughs> um, we are RIAs, registered investment advisors, financial planners. Um, so we're more PCP doctor than than uh, specialist. Than, than the cardiologist. Uh, we're, at the end of the day, we're, we're asset allocators for our clients, but we're not running money in the, in the traditional portfolio management sense of the word. Mm -hmm. Like in okay. your like some people when you say money managers, and by the way, we have some characters on Twitter who purport to be these big time money managers who are actually RIAs. And uh, we have right? a little bit of trouble with some of them telling stories about stocks like Tesla and stuff like that. Yeah, but that's I'm more sure. like your old school broker, right? I mean, you get some people that are like, here are my picks, you know, and I'm going to get right. you in Tesla, I'm going to get you in these pot stocks, and that's kind of what they do. Uh, they certainly haven't moved to the sophistication of, of your model, you know, your Four Seasons model, for example, right. uh, and really I started to think about what a broker might have thought turning into asset allocation. Right. Well, it, it, it goes beyond that. It's, it's the advice that we give. Uh, you know, we, we have the belief that, that most people uh, want to want to develop a plan in mm -hmm. life, have a plan, but they just lack the tools to do it. Mm -hmm. So in many ways, we provide the tools to do that, to set goals, to create long-term strategies uh, so that they can be successful, uh, secure, uh, financially independent. Mm -hmm. that's, that's really where we, where we focus. Mm -hmm. um, the investment part is, is very important, but in many ways, we think the industry gets it a little bit backwards in that the wealth management industry tends to focus on investing first, prioritizes the investment process as the first thing that you do, tends to overcomplicate it, mm -hmm. and, you know, for whatever reason, maybe to position yourself in a way so that you're, you're smarter or perceived smart to be smarter. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the reality is that you don't need to. It's, you, you just keep it simple. Uh, our motto is simple, transparent, low cost. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and stay in our lane as far as the asset allocation is concerned. Mm -hmm. I can get into the process. Yeah, we'll get into the process yeah. too. I mean, and obviously I'm biased towards your you know, parts of your process because um, sure. it adheres to almost everything that we believe in. But just uh, one more, th or a couple more things on the industry. I mean, sure. it, like you said, there are a lot of people that do this. I mean, mm -hmm. there, unless my the numbers are wrong from this uh, post Gazette article. I got to be careful with some, um, some, some old media information here. But um, you know, there, are there really 700 companies that run more than a billion dollars as RAs yeah. in, in yeah. America? Yeah, that's that's shocking to me. Yeah. You that's think that's huge. high, or do you think it's low? no? That's high because that's oh, a, okay. that's a, a it's a lot of money, and that's a lot of firms. I yeah. mean, especially if they're doing it um, a little bass backwards, like you just said, in terms of their approach relative to what you think is the new right. way forward. Right. Right. Um, well, it's a, it's a fragmented industry, Keith, if you think about it. Um, there are so many different corners of the industry that are doing, or at least attempting to do the same thing, yeah. providing financial planning, fiduciary guidance, 
asset management. Um, you think about it, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the wirehouses are in the business, right. the, the commercial banks, that, That's uh, included in the 700, 700 over a billion? No, that, no, no. That 700 number is just RIAs, Registered Investment Advisors, mm -hmm. just the independent channel, which mm. is what we're in. We're in the independent channel. It's the fastest growing channel in the industry. It's growing by 8%, 8 to 9% a year. The wirehouse uh, uh, sh um, had negative growth last year. Wow. Yeah, minus 2% because there's a big breakaway movement from the wirehouses into the independent channel. Mm -hmm. So um, we're, we're now competing with them on the, on the independent side. Well, we're seeing that because, of course, if you were in the wirehouse using the old walls research, you were kind of trapped and almost you know, having to give your clients solutions that are from the mothership. Right. And of course, if you're new wall versus old wall, that's the opportunity is to break free. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. you're seeing an opportunity to just roll up, uh, or I shouldn't say roll up, uh, buy, you know, smaller RIAs and build yourself yeah. bigger is better type format. Yeah, indeed. We, uh, we are very, uh, uh, we're very comfortable, very confident with our process. Yeah. And, and, and again, Hedgeye plays a big role in that uh, on the asset allocation side, but we're very confident with our fiduciary advisory process, both with wealth management, private clients, and, and with qualified retirement plans. We have a, a pretty good sized 401k business uh, that has, has really just come to us, not come to us, we had a, uh, uh, we had a foothold in that, in that marketplace, uh, but we've made some acquisitions in the last three years that have added substantially to our 401k roster, mm -hmm. for sure. And so I, I think what's driving that is it's, it, it, it's requiring scale in this industry to grow effectively. And mm -hmm. to grow effectively, you have to be growing at least 15 to 20% a year. 15 to 20% a year? 15 to wow. 20%. And, and the only way to do that is to acquire smaller companies. Pretty, pretty much. Yeah. You, you know, organic growth, you would hope to be able to power that at, at somewhere in the in 8 to 9 to 10% range. Mm -hmm. 401ks grow 9 to 12%. Yeah. Uh, faster. Phenomenal. You've got the you know, participant contributions, the company matches. You know, uh, if the company's growing, you have more participants. So it's pretty healthy growth. And uh, I, that's been pointed out to me, to, to my two new partners uh, who are terrific, about 85 years of experience between. They're not that old, actually. <laughs> <laughs> they, they may be watching. I better be careful. Uh, but, but they're really good. And they've, they've pointed that out. And, and I can see it. Yeah. And well, 401ks, I mean, I've, I've had, I mean, uh, as Hedge Eye's always been, it's this like surreal experience that I'm living where, uh, we have this process and people are Im Im imputing into what they do, creating appendages to what they do. But I've had a lot of feedback on 401ks. Yeah. You know, like, mm -hmm. oh, wow, this is what you do in your 401k, Keith. This is what I want to do in my 401k or my R you know, my Roth IRA, whatever it is, because they're long only. Yeah. And I would right. have never thought in a, a million years yeah. that I'd be your, your long only guy. But what we're really doing with the process in terms of asset allocating is getting away from the big landmines that have bombed 401ks That's for right. a long period of time. Yeah. 401k, of course, makes a ton of sense in terms of you know, a tax strategy. If you didn't do it, you're kind of like, you probably need to do a little work. Yeah. You know, we even have to, we have, we have to teach our own employees like why they should be contributing to a 401k. Right. Um, but I, I've actually been quite humbled on how people are using the hedge eye process purely in 401k strategies. I think it's great. It's an, it absolutely applies. And I think you'll be happy to hear that I've got my 401k practically totally aligned to the fall season and or to uh, quadrant three. Yeah. <laughs> we got, we'll get into the process, yeah. but uh, to, to quad three. And, and uh, yeah, I use, uh, I use the process pretty religiously, especially in the 401k side. Yeah, that, that, that to me, how big, how big is the 401k part of your business, like as a percentage? It is, it's 35% uh, of our business. We, uh, I mean, just to give you a little background, when we first met, which was, I believe, nine years ago, we were, we were trying to figure that out, <laughs> I think nine years ago, and uh, in New Haven, and uh, it was great, and uh, you guys all had fleeces on, and I walk in, it's freezing in your office. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't afford it. <laughs> no, I know that, I know. I know. <laughs> But it was it was great to learn about your process, data dependent. You know the grind every morning, the whole thing, and and that's what really I think really uh, captured you know captured us and, and your vision. But um, so uh, at that point, we probably had about eight or nine employees, about two hundred fifty million dollars in assets, and and so since then we were now two offices. We're headquartered in Pittsburgh. We have an office in Toledo. 
Um, and uh, we've gone from 250 million to 5.5 billion. Mm, that's amazing. That's uh, just that's most a, of that is 401k assets. So uh, such a the, it's such a great story. The um, and congrats on that. I mean, it's uh, we were both or I was little a littler, I suppose. I was just starting, uh, but I'll never I'll never forget that. The um, and by the way, if you have <laughs> questions for uh, Dave, pop them in the queue. I'll I'll start asking those after I at least get my own in. Uh, but let's go, let's go into the process. Like, cause sure. again, I think, I mean, what you've done is amazing and um, it's also illustrative of how to maybe do it. Um, both, I don't know if, if we should start with at the individual level, maybe more like how, would, how, how should we structure that discussion? Should we talk about how, how a new account would come into you and how, you would, how, would, how you'd use the process to start with that or, or would you maybe. take more of a top down you know, view of it? I, I, maybe it makes sense to talk a little bit about how it evolved, okay. uh, because there's Perfect. really good people involved, uh, including yourself and Darius yep. and, and, and your, your quadrant, your GIP quadrant model. But um, when we first met, it was, it was hard to figure out how we could incorporate Hedgeye. I think at first, yep. I mean, we were enamored with your sector analysis and, and you know, we were using some individual picks. And, yep. But again, we're not money managers, we're asset allocators. So that, uh, I mean, we soon found out that we're getting whipsawed by, you know, pundits on TV and, and headlines and so forth. And so and stocks, they're whippy. I mean, it's just kind, whippy, kind of like right. that, that was the old model. And that's actually what I had in the beginning, as many people know. I'd have Brian, I still have that today. It's a right. great part of our business. Brian McGough, Howard Penny, Todd Jordan, and all of our analysts making calls on stocks. I mean, there's a lot of value in that, but that's not what, like you said, that's not what you're in the business of mm -hmm. doing, per se. Mm -hmm. So, so we evolved, and, and we again we were uh, we were anchored on data dependent. You know, let's eliminate the sentiment from from the process, decision making process. Right. And so, when you began to roll out or evolve your GIP process, I think that's when we grab grabbed hold yep. because that made sense. It was it was identifying where where we are, what's wh where we are in the economic cycle, and and how to invest based upon where we are in the economic cycle. So um, that, that resonated with us. And, and uh, just like you have good people working with you daily to, uh, you know, to determine, to run your models and determine where, uh, where the puck is going, so to speak, with the, with the economy, uh, you know, we've got great people on, on our side. Yep. Uh, Chief Investment Officer Mike Aresti, who is, uh, you know, who, who uh, leads our investment committee. He's phenomenal. He's yeah. great. Yes, he okay, all the right hockey questions. Guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. he asks all the right questions. I mean, yeah. I, I meet with a lot of CIOs, a lot of PMs. He, from day one, asking the right questions all the time. Yeah. Made our process better by asking us to find the yeah. information. Yeah, he's a smart guy. He, he's good. He's a smart guy. And, and how long ago, I mean, I guess, so, so when would you say that, like, that when, when, it'd be interesting to hear, when do you think we actually commercialize or refine the GIP modeling process? I was trying to think, I, yeah, I was, I was hoping you wouldn't ask me that. Um. I, I actually don't, <laughs> I, I don't know, I mean, when a client would say that answers. I, what I do know is that what I have now is a lot, it actually surprises people because people would naturally think having the lowest SAT score at Yale that I could, I, I probably are not as bright as I speak with conviction, but yeah. they, then they look at the model there, what the hell, how the heck did he come up with this thing? Yeah. You know, and, and infrequently do I get criticized on the model. I'll get criticized on my hair, my weight, all that stuff, uh, on style, but not on actually that, 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 that model becoming, I think commercialized is the right word. I don't know if mm -hmm. that's the right word to use. Yeah, uh, we'll call it more, maybe more mainstream within your subscriber base. Right. Uh, you know, where, where, we, where we're paying attention to it on a daily basis. Daily, right? So, yeah, yeah, daily. Uh, certainly monthly, uh, quarterly, of course, with the quarterly themes, but, uh, Boy, I, I would hazard a guess, and I would say probably somewhere in the uh, 2012, 13, 14, yep. somewhere in there. Coming into it, that, that's probably one of, I, I would agree with that, because that's when the model picked up the acceleration in the U.S. economy in 2013. Mm -hmm. It got ahead of interest rates rising in kind. Yeah. And I think that that's when people are like, wow, you guys were bearish. How did you go bullish, and how did you come up with that answer? Yeah, I, that, that makes sense, yeah. because... We were very fortunate to have, have gotten that advice at that time because we were able to put our foot on the accelerator yep. in 2013, and that made a big difference. Mm -hmm. Made a big difference with clients, and from there we evolved the process and actually added our own narrative just to call it the Four Seasons yep. process because clients, clients relate to that. They, they relate to yep. things they know. 
And, and so, uh, you know, quad one, two, three, four, you've got summer at one, or excuse me, spring at one, summer at two, fall, and then winter. Winter and, is four. Winter is four. Winter is coming. You threw that in there that way, right? <laughs> is it the other way around? Aren't we uh, headed to fall? For those of, for people who don't know what the four quadrant map is, it's on slide six in the current uh, macro deck, just so that you can follow along as uh, as Dave goes through. You know how he talks about you know the the it's effectively like an all all season or all weather model, right? So well, you have quad, <laughs> quad one again for you, which is the top left corner yeah. is. Spring? Springtime, right. <laughs> like right. That's a, we colored it properly then. There you go. Okay. And then there quad two is, in your vernacular, is? is summer. Summer, okay. So, so starting to heat up, you know, yeah. growth is heating up, the Fed is starting to pay attention. Yeah, interest uh, rates are going higher, right. not lower. Treasuries are not a good place to be. Right. And then you, got, you go to the third quadrant after that? That's fall. Fall. Uh, you know, it kind of signals peak growth. Yep. And, and be careful. Yep. You know, the warning bells start to go off. Mm -hmm. I think we were there, uh, what, last last fall uh, or, or late summer? Mm -hmm. well, what do you mean? Once, and then once you get into the fourth quadrant, which is winter is coming for you Game of Thrones fans, uh, you don't want to be run over by the White Walkers in asset allocation space. That's right. Yeah, that's like a, and it, it was such a violent thing that happened to a lot of people in their 401ks. Big time. Um, did you, did you, how'd you guys do in the fourth quarter? We did pretty well. Right. Uh, yeah, we, we took to heart, be, began to take to heart in late spring that, that uh, the, the cycle was changing and that, uh, that we, it was time to become more defensive. Mm -hmm. We have five, uh, five portfolio models uh, based on risk profiles, everything from conservative to aggressive and moderate, you know, moderately conservative, neutral, uh, moderately aggressive. And, uh, and so those five models uh, all uh, are allocated to traditional asset classes, stocks, right. uh, stocks bonds, cash. Mm -hmm. and, and so and we're, you know, we take to heart the, uh, the asset classes or the, uh, the individual uh, sectors that you're recommending within, within the season. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we're, we're making changes or adjustments as the season changes. Right. And we're actively managing the models, but it's, it's based on a pretty tr tight process. We have bands. We have ban risk bands or percentage bands of how much we're investing in each category depending upon the sector, whether and we want to be aggressive or more defensive. So you have basically, you've come, you've come up with five different models that reflect the four different seasons. That's right. And those tilts within the model have to do with what? How, how do you tilt up and down in terms of the timing? Has, or do you go do, fully allocated? We're fully allocated. Uh, we maintain maybe 5%, maybe 10% cash. Right. Uh, because things can change. As, uh, as we've seen this, this quarter, uh, you know, things can change pretty rapidly. So we stay fully invested, uh, uh, stocks, stocks, bonds, cash, uh, so that we're not caught off sides. But we're, uh, we're, we're reducing the exposure to stocks, for example, as, as the season's changing. Yep. So as we're, exactly. you know, as, as we're going from summer to almost winter, uh, you know, we're, we're making that change in the yep. portfolio. We're reducing the stock exposure, becoming more defensive in the, in the, the stock sectors that we own. Yep. You know, for, we're going from technology in spring, summer to uh, real estate and uh, consumer staples utilities yeah. in, in winter. In the winter, yeah. yeah. Now, how much, now your, your, your traditional old wall marketing guy would say, that sounds all good and fine, but that sounds like you're churning the, churning the guy's 401k or the gal's 401k. Is, do they feel that way or are they more happy not that they didn't not, lose 20% well, of their money? Yeah, not at all. Think of it this way. <laughs> the, the kind of the secret in the business is that uh, Ray Dalio, uh, you know, more or less had it right with his all weather portfolio, if you think about it, yeah. uh, the 35% uh, bonds, 55% stocks, 10% gold. You, you set it and forget it, and 30 years later, you're going to be okay. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you had the discipline to stay with it. Mm -hmm. Now, most clients don't have the discipline. Most advisors don't. Have, I mean, practically no one has the <laughs> discipline to stay with that. Yeah. So, but it, it, it works. Uh -huh. and, and so, and so, it, it, it's, so our, our process is, is an extension of that, but we're making relatively modest or reasonable changes, again, as the season changes, as it makes sense to be in different 
sectors, mm -hmm. you know, within the within the the, uh, uh, the asset classes, um, and it depends on the client's risk profile. We have a a questionnaire, a, a proprietary questionnaire that's aligned with yeah. this, so that so that that can tell us what what the risk profile. Well, that, that's is. something, I, and, you, and you watch the macro show like sometimes, I think. Uh, yeah, I, think I do. You, you guys I watch. do. Mike Oresti every day he yeah. sets his clock back. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank yeah. you uh, for that. And, and I'm always humbled by how many you know institutional and large institutions like the one you're building you know yeah. tune into that show. I think some people that are more, uh, I think if you're an individual subscriber to Hedgeye, you might not know that, but most of the questions that we get are from sophisticated investors and CIOs like Mike Oresti. So, I mean, at the end of the day, that that's, uh, like I said, it's humbling and it helps us learn faster. Uh, but what I struggle with sometimes is is trying to have an answer. I call it that Tiffany blue box. At least when I came to America, that was a pretty cool thing to see. You know, I like, think it still is. You know, for, <laughs> but, but there is no Tiffany blue box for everybody out there. I mean, no, there, there and, and I struggle with that. I, I struggle with how do, how do I communicate, you know, the platform, the data, um, everything we built and give people one kind of Occam's razor simple answer when there just is, that just is never going to be the reality. You, you have to figure it out. Again, it's taken us literally years to figure it out. Yeah. To try to find that alignment and, and we feel like we're there, uh, but as you mentioned off camera, um, it's, it's constantly evolving. We're constantly improving. It's constant uh, process of improvement as you say your process is. And so we hope to evolve as you're evolving, and, and uh, you know we hope to make our process you know that much better. Uh, we actually think it's it's something that that could be marketable. It's a, it's a product that that could be marketable to other RIAs. Yeah, I, I think uh, because what it does is it frees you up mm -hmm. to do what we think is the important work, and that is uh, the planning work. Uh, you know. Um, uh, the advice that we give both on the wealth management side and the 401k side. Yeah, the, that's the that's the real value add after you've not made blow up decisions. I mean, right. Uh, for those of you that don't know what it looks like, uh, slide eight guys, if you can just show, I'm just gonna circle what uh, Dave just said that they did, you know, when they came out of um, what he was calling summer and going into the winter uh, from quad two to quad four, uh, if I just make a real simple uh, 401k example of, of how my 401k, at least I traded it. Um, trade, yes, you have to make a trade to make a long-term decision. It's not a bad word. Um, but at the end of the day, you had these things right here, your equity sector overweights in quad two, and for that matter, in quad one. It's because you have growth is positive. Is You have tech, that's why you know, Dave mentioned tech, uh, industrials, consumer discretionary, all the fun stuff. You know, that's the stuff with the big multiples, the big stocks, the big stories, uh, would include most of the FANG components. But then once you get to the fourth quadrant and you end up in you know, what uh, Dave calls winter, you know, those things actually quad four, your equity sector underweights are your former overweights, right? So in a long only portfolio, you're basically just taking them out. That's all you had to do is just take them out. And then you take that capital and you put it into um, what, what Dave mentioned, which is, you know, old Yeller. Like this is like healthcare, preferably uh, big cap pharma, consumer staples, REITs, utilities. Um, and that's, that's, I think that that's like, even though that is a very simple pivot, it's hard to get the timing right. It is, it is. And how, how, do, you, um, how do you communicate that to, to somebody who's obviously made a lot of money or they wouldn't be a client of yours to give you a lot of their money? Uh, how do you communicate to them that market timing is actually a component of what you do? Or would you use those words like I do? Those dirty words. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't. I don't think we we would necessarily use those words. Uh, we might use the word timing. Uh, where, t where it's important that we we time this right, that we rebalance in a way that's that's sensible, that's aligned with our research partner who is analyzing analyzing the data, the data, running the numbers every day to determine yep. you know how how this is moving. And, and has a, a track record that is is uh, uh, you know very impressive in terms of in terms of getting the big moves right, the big pivots right. So when those happen, we don't always know that those are happening at that particular time, but we have to be wary that they might be. Mm -hmm. So we 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 take heed, we listen, we uh, we make the decision within our investment committee as to how we're going to pivot, mm -hmm. uh, whether we're doing it with a broad asset class uh, like stocks or bonds, and then within those categories, 
does it make sense to reallocate to different sectors, yep. to allocate away from technology, for example, the, the, the example that you just gave, mm -hmm. and, and more towards utilities, for mm -hmm. example. Um, our clients have, have come to not only trust the process, but be interested in the process. Oh, that's cool. You know, for, first, first question they ask is, Dave, what season are we in? <laughs> That's awesome. So, so I look outside and I say, well, um, yeah, but they do ask that question. They're interested. Mm -hmm. So they're now, they're now getting, getting part of the process, you know, how important it is to, mm -hmm. uh, to be aware, aware of where we are in the, uh, the economic cycle. It's so easy to get caught up in what's happening in the news, mm -hmm. uh, uh, on TV, in the newspaper. It, it's so easy to get caught up with headlines and what pundits are saying and so forth. And that's not how to manage. No, no, no. I mean, it's, um, I was, uh, I write about this and I rant about this all the time, but just like, it's, it's not, Old Wall talks about people's opinions. We want to talk about a process. You know, there, there, there's a big difference. I mean, I, I still, I'm shocked, but um, satisfied that that's what the competition does, or we would not have uh, a monetizable market opportunity uh, to play against that backboard, mm -hmm. and that's um, that's a big deal. Uh, on the and and people will care about this for sure. Maybe if I kind of draw it out quickly, um, if you uh, so because you mentioned and let's maybe just use like three different three of the five conservative, neutral, and aggressive um, portfolios. Yeah, it's it's um, it's it's uh, aggressive, moderately aggressive, neutral, okay. moderately conservative. But if we were just to take, yeah. like, if I just use uh, conservative, neutral, and aggressive, mm -hmm. um, what would, if you go like bonds, because you, you made a very important point versus um, stocks, and you included with value and gave them the benefit of 10% gold, right? Right. And you said 35, 55, plus 10, you're at 90, you mm -hmm. could be 5 to 10% cash. That works, but if you can get the mix right, you know, what you're doing is you're really picking within the seasons. Right. But on these, like, this is actually the style. Like if, if I'm a conservative, what would like, I don't want to hold you to a specific yeah. number, but if you're a conservative, um, what does a conservative portfolio uh, allocate bonds to relative to the aggressive portfolio? Right now like, it's close to 60%. Okay, so 60% would be yeah, there. 60% bonds and you're allocating within different bond sectors, right. bond types, yeah. whether Which, treasuries, uh, which, which that also fits the four quadrant playbook it because does. we're showing you, you know, where high yield, you know, even levered loans uh, converts outperform relative to duration. But th would they be in bonds? Aggressive would be uh, twenty-five to thirty percent. Okay, so we're it's about half. And and their their stock allocation would be it would have more, more so they'd have be more the mirror, mirror opposite. opposite. Okay, yeah. okay, yeah. Okay, so that's that's pretty interesting. But when you tilt in an aggressive account, it doesn't matter. Like somebody traditionally would say, oh, aggressive. I got to always buy the fang. Right. No, 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 no. It's just actually what percentage you are stocks versus bonds. Yeah. And in here, right now, you probably have REITs, utilities, housing, stuff yeah. like that, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you just have less treasuries. That's right. OK. Mm -hmm. um, and neutral is just somewhere in between. Yeah, that's correct. But you guys have taken it to five different models, so you can be even sharper within, you know, it's, I guess, do the two other models fit inside these two wedges? They do. Okay. Yeah, that's exactly. And interestingly, interestingly the moderately conservative portfolio is uh, very similar to the Dalio model. Uh, yeah. More by, uh, I don't want to say accident, but it's not by, by choice, but it's just, that's how it's allocated based upon all the uh, moderately uh, conservative that go into it. fits right in here. Correct. So I'll use my favorite. My yeah, I talk about her all the time. Pink. Uh, my girlfriend away from home. Yeah. It's my favorite color here to use. So that's the fifty-five that you're talking about. Fifty-five. That's correct. That's the beautiful one right there, right? Yep. Thirty-five, fifty-five. Okay, that that's cool. Because um, I think people struggle with this real basic thing. I struggle with it. Yeah. I, I then get into okay, if I if I'm going to be long a bond in my four hundred one k, what's my max position in one of those? Like for example, TLT. People say, "Hey, I love the TLT." Uh, when we're when we're really right on it, some people want to get a, a tattoo of TLT. It gets really crazy, and I'm like, "I'm just not going to go above 10% of my capital in one of those things." Mm -hmm. So if, if I'm conservative, which I wouldn't fit in, into that, um, but if I'm running the Dalio portfolio, okay, now I got 10 invested right. in bonds. I got to find room for more. For more. Right. So then I'd go extended duration bonds, zero coupon bonds, any way that I can find duration. Mm -hmm. I'd add short-term bonds, long-term right. bonds across the curve. So that's how I get my fill on the 55. 
Yeah, exactly. Does that make sense? Yeah. Instead of like over-indexing, because I think some people, they, they like really, like if it's their first day buying bonds, because CNBC's never showed somebody to buy a bond. I mean, they're trying right. to get you to buy Tesla or Bitcoin. Right. Uh, um, they, don't, <clears throat> they don't really think about the, the asset allocation decision, what the sizing of those positions should be. That's right. And that's critically important. I mean, do you want to have 55% in TLT? <laughs> no. <laughs> Maybe right now, that, but it, that'd be a bet. That's not asset allocation. Right. That'd be a big bet. Yeah. That'd be a gamble. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so do you guys have limits uh, sensibly at the position level within yes. each of the five models? Yes. Okay. Yes, awesome. indeed. Awesome. Now, what else, because uh, we're going to get, uh, we get a lot of questions now okay. coming in. But um, what, el what else is it within what you've built are kind of playbook moves that you've learned that you could teach me like a better way? Because I want to help people like use what I'm doing in a better way. Because mm -hmm. I can't do it for them. And, and you're doing a great job with it on your own. So, so what are some well, of the other things? I think there's some other components. For example, in, in the categories themselves, we're using, uh, talk about the, the types of securities. We're, we're using ETFs, right. index ETFs predominantly, uh, but also actively managed funds, institutional great. mutual funds where, where it applies, where, where the market is less efficient, mm -hmm. um, international, for example, or even emerging markets. So you take an active own. EM manager if you're allocating to some EM exposure? More than likely, yeah. yes. A Vanguard, uh, typically. A Vanguard or a Charles Schwab. Because you like low fees. We like low fees. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, yeah. that's just part of it. But right? you'll that's, pick, not, you, that's not everything. You will pick managers. We will. Yeah, or allocate yeah. a percentage of yes. the Okay, now yes. you can see how if I pick managers that could or could be a very good thing for a short period of time would also compromise the relationship because what happens when I you know tell you to short the manager? Right. That's not right. gonna that's that relationship will end. Mm -hmm. uh, which has happened a couple times unfortunately. <laughs> but, <laughs> but so you okay, so that's yeah. one. What would another one be? Stocks, you add sto single stocks. We we have single stocks, but not in in, these, in this model. In, these, in right. this model. So if we're working with a high net worth client where it makes sense to di diversify beyond the the eight or nine positions we might have in each of these models, uh, we'll have separate account managers okay, that cool. own individual stocks that have a specific um, specific style that m might manage large cap dividend stocks mm -hmm. or maybe mid cap growth stocks. Uh, so the individual account managers is becomes more prevalent, more important at, at the higher net worth mm -hmm. level. Yeah, that's um, that's another good example of I get a lot of feedback on this cannabis sector. You know, like mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not a I'm not a big pot guy. It doesn't matter if I if I was or wasn't, but a tremendous amount of high net worth subscribers care about these calls we're making on single pot stocks. Wow. And um, you know, our guys done a great job. They've done they've done really well. Yeah. Um, but I wonder like how you'd implement that into somebody's you know a, a DBR and co. I mean, that's really. That's a little racy, isn't it? I mean, yeah. it sounds a little versus the. <laughs> we would, we would, we would, uh, we would tread very carefully. Uh, <laughs> we'd look, we'd absolutely look at your research, but um, you know that that is such a that's a hot, that's a hot sector. It's it's volatile. It, yeah. you, there's much more to lose than to gain. I think by yeah. making yeah. recommendations there, and we don't saying, have that expertise. Yeah, you're talking about asset allocation, asset allocation, wealth management. Right. The art of not losing other people's money. That's correct. Uh, yeah. Which so many people are so horrendous at. I, I wonder why there are 700 uh, firms that are running that kind of money. But I mean, that's a huge opportunity uh, for you. Yeah, Any other pivots you. within the model that, that you've used that are uh, things that you've said, hey, look, mm -hmm. Keith doesn't say it like this, but we think that we could do it like that. I, you know, we, we stay in our lanes uh, for the most part. Uh, um, other pivots, uh, I'll, have to, I'll have to think about that. Yeah. Um, I, having a just having the technology to be able to do this that's a big deal across yeah. across Being able to 600 plus it. clients or yeah. more yeah. Uh, in our case uh, but we have 600 uh, flagship clients which is our private client above a million dollars um, that that would uh, that requires a rebalancing technology that you know you've got to align with your custodian yeah. and and make sure it's working and make sure you can place large trades without making mistakes and so forth and so, so that on. everybody gets the same expression in their portfolio at the That's same correct. time yeah. that, same that execution is, when i came into the yeah. i mean 20 years ago now i'm going to age myself but i mean it's like we had a managed account business the yeah. the, the hedge fund that i worked with and it was such a pain 
you know, to just, just again, execute and uh, notify and send out reports. Yeah. I mean, it's the, 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 that's another beautiful thing about what's happened is that, uh, of course, I think our model's beautiful and everything that you created is too, but it, it, you couldn't do it with technology and low cost execution. No. You couldn't. No. So and, and that's how this works. Right. It, it's it's got to be it's got to be technology driven. It's got to be low cost. You've got to have a research process that data driven, not sentiment driven, and you've got to have a model around it that that you're comfortable with, that you're confident is going to be repeatable. Right. What do you think the percentage? If I were to call, I don't even know if this is a fair way to ask the question, but the unit costs to execute a portfolio versus when you first like in 2011, oh, 2010, is it come down like 50 percent, 100 percent? I can execute at, at not to, I'm not going to actually at fidelity. Mm -hmm. I can execute any single ETF trade in fixed income for free. Yeah. I mean, so for that's the most part, low. we can too. Yeah. Okay. So you can, so you capitalize on all these same mm -hmm. factors. Sure. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a phenomenal thing. I mean, I was joking this morning on the macro show. I said I could go to the bathroom and go from a 10% position to eight and then back to 10 if I felt like lunchtime was a better time to buy the bonds. But I mean, it's like, <laughs> it's actually, it's crazy yeah. that you can, I, I think it's awesome. Yeah. You know, it's great. We're, we're living in a great period and it, it's driving everything, right? The costs are going to zero. Uh, it's, on the investment side, it's becoming much more commoditized for the manufacturers. So yeah. that's something for us to take advantage of. Yeah. Right. And uh, but on the advice side, not so much. We're not feeling that same pressure. We're we're feeling it in, in terms of a fragmented industry that's consolidating. Mm -hmm. So it's it's really important that we we try to stay ahead of that that game. That we yeah. have scale so that we can continue to grow. That we can recruit. Uh, we, we can attract bigger clients, uh, bigger advisors, uh, so that we can yeah. we can stay at a growth rate that that keeps this this That's whole awesome. thing valid. I mean, so many people you know complain about the industry or complain about growth in America. Meanwhile, like the biggest industry with the most large S and lack of evolution is the one that we work in. Yeah. And it's, I think like, I like to stay in my lane, you stay in your lane yeah. together. That's like one plus one equals three. Exactly. It's, um, you know, a lot of people often ask me, well, if you're good at this, why don't you go run money? It's a different job. It is. It's a different job. Asset allocation, what you do is a different job than what I have, but together, you know, we're helping each other, you help each other do yeah, it better. Yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, some questions uh, as opposed to evangelizing on that. Somebody sure. called me, um, I forget the name of the guy. It was some evangelist the other day. I'm not an evangelist. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, here's a good question. Uh, thanks for the thanks for the setup with the different models. What do the returns look like with those different models? Um, is, is there a simple answer for that? Yeah, the simple answer is is that we're we have a three year track record with with each of the models outperforming their benchmarks by about 150 hmm. percent. And that's with fees, that's after fees. And the benches are against conservative bench, neutral bench, aggressive bench. Correct. And the bench is a blended benchmark with uh, ind indices representing the, the various uh, asset classes. That's so, awesome. So Barclays Aggregate Bond on the bond side, S&P 500, IFA index, yeah. if we're blending in uh, uh, foreign stocks. Et yeah. Now, some yeah. just knowing the you know the the breadth of our audience, some people might have thought of the, the answer to that question is how much do I make absolute? But the whole point is that unless you tell us if you're conservative, neutral, or aggressive, that's it's a different question. Yeah. And we want you to be smarter about this. I mean, you've not been uh, the old wall hasn't made you smarter at this. We know that. Uh, so let's. Interestingly, the best performing model out of all of them, best performing in terms of percentage above, above benchmark is the moderately conservative. The, yeah, I believe that. The all-weather Ray Dalio. Yeah, there, I mean, he, he runs uh, the most, or at least uh, uh, by my math, uh, you know, one of the most impressive companies to scale with multiple fees, too. Mm -hmm. And he also has structured his fee structure based on the aggressiveness of the portfolio. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, Ray Dalio agrees 100% with our views, which some would say that I worked back. Some, one guy said I re-engineered his views. I'm like I'm not. No, I'm just. I'm just mucker. I mean, like I just like we just did the math, and it just so happens that this guy wrote a book called Principles yeah. that explained the two principal factors or the two causal factors for returns at the asset allocation level, at the sector style level, at the factor exposure level are the rate of change of growth and inflation. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ray Dalio, for writing that book. It's a it's a very good book, mm -hmm. um, and um, an important one. Um, here's another question. Um, do you, David, do you have an, a core allocation for each model, then have a band or sleeve that you use to change sectors? 
I think we talked. We about do. That. We do actually. Uh, although the the core the core changes as well, but we do incorporate or sprinkle in individual sectors, stock stack sectors, for example. Yeah. Utilities be a, a really good example, or technology. Um, uh, any of the individual uh, industry sectors will sprinkle in on the stock side probably close to 10 percent. Yeah. 10 to 15 percent depending upon the the risk profile. Yeah. But we'll do that and, and we'll manage that a little bit more actively. Mm -hmm. Yeah there's some sneaky pivots you can make in there too like this is a more yeah, I'm learning as we go too. We've, ne we've actually not gone from for example quad four to quad three for three quarters in a row. Quad, so in other words, on slide uh, 39, you could see our current uh, outlook is quad four, then quad three, quad three, quad three. So for three quarters in a row, we're going to be in quad three. Uh, we've not had, uh, I think guys, actually I don't want to draw on that. You guys can just read it for yourself. It's at the bottom there. Um, but that last time that happened, Dave, was, was back in 1994. I was, an, I, was, I was a noob at, you know, you know, trying to make the hockey team at Yale in 1994. <laughs> I mean, I was like trying to make the fourth line. Uh, and I stayed I on the I was playing Mesley. <laughs> <laughs> but, but but I'm at, I mean it, it's it's to me it's the, why I get up in the morning because yeah, I get right. to play a new hand every year right because the cards don't appear that I think of that now as card counting um, or bean counting it's better to be a card player than a bean counter yeah. uh, but it's the same thing it's it's just that that and and prior to that the last time we went from quad four to quad three in a row was uh, actually in 1990. Uh, and both times coming out of quad four, oil doubled in both cases. Is that right? Um, so again, the model's working, energy's going up, energy stocks are working. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, so, so that's fun. It's fun to be right for the right reasons. Um, Dave, do you use shorts in your models? No. No? No. Woo! Long only. That could yeah. be a new business. We manage, ma well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we, we'd have to he doesn't, he doesn't be do snug. <laughs> yeah. Now, what if we had a, uh, what if, like on Tesla? Yeah. Um, because our guys, you know, Jay Van Skyver is the bear. Um, what if, and, and your guys are like, wow, this, we think Hedge is going to be right on this. Or on some of the MLPs, for example, might be another good example um, uh, that went to zero. Mm -hmm. Like if you get an account, a new account comes to you, uh, you got a new account from the guys in Toledo, and the number one position in their account is Tesla. Or mm -hmm. Lynn Energy, which mm -hmm. we, we, we un, you know, unapologetically said was going to zero and did. Yeah. Like, what, will, will, you, will you say, hey, this is, a, this is potential risk? Will you use had your research in that regard? A absolutely. And, and you know, hopefully we would discover that up front. We'd, we'd know that up front, uh, that that's an you know, ex extremely large position. Yeah. Uh, we have money managers in-house that can help us with that, but that's a question we'd likely run by you, yeah. by, by your team. Yeah, because I know you've been back and forth on yeah. things like yeah. that. Because you never know what you're going to get. Right. Right. I mean, right. Um, David, similar to Mike's question below, what's your current ranges within asset classes? When you pivoted from quad one to quad three, for instance, do you ever change from aggressive to conservative models? So do you change no. from model to model? No, that's, that's a great question. Uh, we do not. Uh, the, the models align with the risk, risk profile of the client. Yep. So, so the, the changes we make are, are within the models themselves yep. to just conform with the, the change in the seasons as, as was described in the question. Yep. So, 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 if so you're, we don't do that. that. That's an important part of the discipline. Do you, do you profile clients by age or anything where you're like, hey, look, I know that you want to be conservative yeah. at this stage, but, that's a, but, what, but what if the guy says, hey, look, I'm 85 and I'm, I want to be aggressive? If he answers the questionnaire, he or she answers the questionnaire that way, and it that's, scores. Okay. That's it. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. That's, uh, that's cool. Because I, I hate that. I yeah. hate that. Like, why, why should somebody, because they're, and again, a lot of us, I mean, I had zero money 20 years ago. Right. Yeah, Negative. Me too. Me too. And they're Canadian dollars, so it might even be worse. <laughs> I mean, you didn't why? keep them. <laughs> <laughs> but people start, people earn their wealth at different stages of life, and God willing, they can maintain that wealth. But how dare we as Wall Street tell them you can't be aggressive when you finally made some money? Mm -hmm. Like the only way to be, you know, to be more wealthy is to be aggressive when you should oh. be aggressive. If, if they score on the questionnaire that they're aggressive, they're aggressive. Right. But we, do don't, we don't override that. Okay. Now, how about like if you say, hey, look, look it's, it's, it's 2013 or moreover, it's 2016, 17, and yeah. part of 18. Yeah. Hey, look, your, your portfolio says it fixed income conservative. Just know that we know, that you know, and you will know, 
that we're going to keep saying this quad one and two stuff, and you're going to miss a big part of the move. Yeah. Like, would you would you ever tell somebody they shouldn't be as conservative and redo the questionnaire? <laughs> No. <laughs> no, you can't do that. I'm starting to get into fiduciary it's, problems yeah, right, right now. Right. Thou shalt cover one's own, you know, behind. Uh, uh, the, the, the questionnaire, I think, is going to evolve. I, I don't know that that's perfect. You know, we're certainly not perfect. But to have the discipline to stick with the questionnaire yeah. is, is the key. That's, that's what the regulator is going to ask when he or she shows up. Yeah, yeah, I got that. What's your process? Do you stick to it? Now that we have, uh, that we have the head of Hedge Eye Compliance listening intently, uh, wake up, buddy. It's time to pay attention. <laughs> I'm not running money, so you know, uh, Dave can deal with these issues. <laughs> so I'm an RA. Oh, here's another question. I'm an RA as well. My CPA calls what I do timing the cycle, not timing markets. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's I, cool. I, yeah. I guess there's, there's a I, lot I of these. I accept that. I guess there's baggage. We, you're just going to have to carry some of yeah, the. You're not. We're, this, uh, the GIP model and, and this approach is not timing the markets. Right. It's, it's timing this, really is timing the cycle. That's, mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a fair way to look at it. Which, you know, Howard Marks, who I, I think most um, CPAs or CFAs or anybody who's ever done this business for a long time, uh, would, you know, he just wrote this book called Mastering the Market Cycle, yeah. uh, which is basically the business cycle. Um, you know, there are plenty of people who believe that if they could, they would. Yeah. Um, so uh, maybe a, a couple more questions. I think we have time for a couple sure. more. Um, hi, David. How do you manage taxable accounts from a turnover, I knew we were going to get this question, from a turnover perspective and balance between risk management and capital gains? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, high tax bracket will be sensitive on the bond side, for sure. Yep. We'll use tax-free bonds and try to be oh, cool. appropriate in terms of the, you know, how we're allocating how we're allocating within the the bond sectors, the tax free bond, the muni bond sectors, mm -hmm. uh, whether we want to be high yield or long duration, shorter duration, et cetera. Um, capital gains, uh, we're actively managing, so we're we're paying attention to that. Uh, we're trying to uh, we're trying to manage for longer term capital gains as opposed to short term capital gains. Mm -hmm. um, we're trying to manage for capital gains. <laughs> uh, as opposed to losses. So, but it's portfolio management. We're, yeah. we're going to try to match and align losses with gains mm -hmm. and, and try to make it as tax efficient in the long run as we possibly can. Right. I mean, we were going through this with, uh, or I showed this slide, I'll show it again, slide 57 guys quickly, um, which shows basically you're in quad one or two for 10 quarters in a row. And everybody knows that that is obviously a long period of time. So you didn't have to really take any capital gains. You could just ride it. Mm -hmm. uh, ideally, everyone would have uh, on the right side a contiguous map where growth is accelerating for 10 quarters in a row, and you don't have to you don't have to take capital gains. Um, the problem is that that's not the way that the world works. Right. And um, I get that feedback a lot. Well, how, how how long typically could you stay in a quadrant? There's nothing typical about this. That would be assuming that the world is linear. Mm -hmm. You know. How typically mm -hmm. are you not going to get in a car accident? Yeah. I, I, know, I can tell you what I want the answer to be, but I'll tell you what, yeah, that that's not the pretty, right answer. It's pretty typical. But, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, um, okay, maybe uh, one more question here. Um, let's see. Do I see an HP RPN calculator on the desk? Yes, you do. Uh, this is uh, what we did at Penance Use. This is old school. I got the tape on the back, kind of like the foil on the knuckles for hockey fans. Um, I well, resemble that. Too. <laughs> you resemble that. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Um, taxable accounts. OK. Uh, dear Mr. Root, for a retired person who, is a, who has a basic pension for daily living, uh, but with very modest savings, uh, that I want to grow safely, just above inflation. Would you be able to give me some generic direction uh, on people like me? I don't know if, if, if you can. I, I guess uh, part of it would be what does the what what does the rest of your portfolio look like? Are are, are you, uh, you know, are you living on just just the pension? Do you have savings beyond that? Do you do you have a four hundred one k that rolled into an IRA? Mm -hmm. Do you have IRA assets? I I would say. To if you're if you're wanting to save money and put money away, um, a dollar cost averaging is a is a fine strategy. It, it depends it depends on your risk profile. Mm -hmm. uh, it depends on your time frame. Yeah. You know, how how old is older? Um, and uh, I think you, you want to be uh, you want to be sensible. You want to be logical. You don't you don't need to you, know, you don't need to throw caution to the wind and 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 roll the dice and bet. 
it's uh, just allocate a good asset allocation fund. One more question, because this is a really cool question, and I, and I don't know the answer, so I want to know before you leave. Um, hi, David. What is the biggest, and this guy's going all caps on biggest, what is the biggest change you've witnessed in your Wall Street career? <sighs> wow. Technology would have to rank right up there. Yeah. I, I started my career in 1983 in Pittsburgh. <laughs> I had a Cutlass Supreme, 80,000 miles, and a map. I, <laughs> so, so, I mean, that's, that's how I started. So think, no GPS, yeah. no, no, no iPhone. I mean, I, I, and I was told to go visit uh, 3,000 uh, orphan policyholders. I started the insurance business. That's where the planning comes in. Yeah. Uh, so uh, technology has to be the biggest, biggest change. Yeah, it's, I'd say costs, that, costs too. Like costs you and tech, yeah. they're all functions. Yeah. I'd say in the last five years, yeah. actually this is an interesting, it's gonna be part of the answer that we we're trying to pin down on when did the GIP model finally yeah, you know, become like to, commercial. Like to know that. It's when computing power became readily available. Yeah. I mean, you couldn't run Python, you know, apply any AI metric, uh, run, well, there was no advanced Excel. I mean, today, when you guys ask us for the updated GIP now, you know, okay. GDP now cast or inflation now cast, boom, it's within 30 seconds to a minute. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Even if the answer is wrong, it's an amazing answer. You know, I, but it, yeah. it's, 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 it's getting faster at a faster rate, I think, that this technological changes. And, mm -hmm. um, and it's good to see that, you know, that everything that you're applying is getting faster and growing faster, too. So, Thank you. Uh, thanks for taking the time.